Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Welcome to the wrong, the long road. I'm your host, um, Chris Roberts, and um, just in case people why ask why, oh, he wears the same shirt mostly all the time. Well, I'm one of those few people in the United States that were actually born in um, Wyoming, and um, so. You know, you got Yellowstone and you get the Grand Tetons and a half a million people. That's how many people live in Wyoming. Hey, in the summer, more people go to Yellowstone than um, that live in the state of Wyoming. So I'm kind of proud of the fact that I was um, one of the few born in <clears throat> Wyoming. So... I'm going to say a little personal story to start the day off, the show off. As I'm listening more and more to the news, the word COVID-19 is popping up more and more. Are we, it's what COVID-19, what is it going to be like? Um, Rutgers University in New Jersey has come out and said, hey, if your kids want to come back to school, they better have the vaccine. Um, I don't even know if they have the vaccine out uh, for the potential um, variants that they might have. But they said you must have the vaccine. School, some schools in Kentucky have, have closed down for a while. They're saying due to COVID illnesses and strep throat and flu-like illnesses, they needed to close the school down. Some of the other schools, like the city of Philadelphia, is looking at mandating the masks coming back. And so, <clears throat> well, we learned a lot from COVID-19. We learned a lot of the things that we thought were true about COVID-19 weren't true at all. We learned if you were over 65, you were at greater risk of dying if you caught COVID-19. Same way with the flu. We knew, we learned if you were overweight, you had blood, high, blood, high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you have serious heart conditions, you have asthma, COPD, you had a greater risk of perishing if you caught COVID-19. The same thing that would have happened if you had the bad cases of the flu. We also learned just today the Department of Justice just came out and put um, arrest warrants for another 300 people who basically scammed the government out of um, almost a billion dollars. And we also learned that um, no, not those Nigerian princess prince who liked to send us those emails made a lot of money off of COVID-19. We learned that the state of California lost billions and billions of dollars of COVID-19 money because people in jails were falsifying and applying 
for un- unemployment and we're getting unemployment. We learned of a rap star who took millions and um, used it to live a, a lavish lifestyle. We know about um, singers and other companies that took up to ten million dollars and paid and paid a um, protection um, loans. Didn't really do anything with it and didn't have to pay it back. We know that billions and billions of dollars in payday protection loans went out as free money to people. Okay. Those basically everybody knows. They know that um, as a result of the COVID lockdown, as the result of shutting down public schools, we have the lowest education scores in the past 40 years. Okay? But we know that a lot of the private schools in the state of New Hampshire and around the country didn't close down. Um, A lot of religious schools didn't close down. The number of deaths and serious illnesses that affected school-aged children were very minor. We know places like the Scandinavian countries, they didn't close down. They didn't have big outbreaks or anything. Those are all the things that we know and people want to talk about. But... We don't like to talk about, there's a few people who do it. We don't like to talk about the people who died needlessly because of the COVID-19 hysteria, you know, the panic. And people will go and say, well, you know, that didn't really happen. You know, people went, you know, it was COVID. We know, yes, we were getting people COVID-related deaths, COVID-related deaths, COVID-related death. Well, there's no question in my mind, and I don't wear a tin hat. I'm not a right-wing conspiracy um, theorist. But there is no doubt in my mind that a lot of people needlessly died because of COVID-19 hysteria. And I will say it again. A lot of people needlessly died because of COVID-19 hysteria. And people would go and say, you know what, Mr. Roberts, that's BS. What do you know? You're not a doctor. How do you know? You're not a scientist like Dr. Fauci and all the other ones. How do you know that? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. How do I know that? How do you know I'm not making up um, some stuff? Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you a little personal story. My normal body temperature is 96.8, not 98.6, 96.8. When I get a fever of 100 especially 101, I'm really hurting. So, one day, back in 2020, I'm hurting, I can't move very much, and my temperature's up to 103. I'm in bed, I'm sweating like crazy. 
my daughter who's a nurse, my other one's a nurse assistant, my wife, they're getting wet face clots and they're trying to um, cool me down, but it wasn't working. They were just drying up real quickly. They called Cheshire Medical. And they said, hey, you know, my father's got 103 temperature. The emergency room at Chester Medical said, do not allow him to come in. He most likely has COVID. Stay home. Then later on, my temperature got up to 104. They called the hospital again. And the emergency room said, do not come in. He most likely has COVID. I really can't move. I'm getting stiff. So the next morning, they take me to Convenient MD. Convenient MD, I think it's Convenient, convenient Care, Convenient MD, the one that's right next to Appleby. The woman doctor says, get your butt down to the emergency room. I go to the, and I says, they won't let me in. They say, she says, I don't care. Get your butt down to the emergency room. I go down to the emergency room <clears throat> and I go in, I wait my turn. They put me in a room, they did some tests and they say, okay, Mr. Roberts, here's some pills, you can go home you most likely get the beginning of pneumonia. <clears throat> okay? So I go home. Next day at 2 o'clock, I get a phone call from the inspection control doctor at Cheshire Medical. And he goes, Mr. Roberts, we need you to get right back into the hospital right now. And I go, why? It says, <clears throat> you have meningitis. I go, what? He says, yes, you have meningitis. When you get to the hospital, tell, let them know at the door who you are. So I get to the hospital, let them know who I am. They bring me upstairs and put me in isolation room where I spend the next night. <clears throat> and so... Next day, I get a phone call from the infection control person, state of New Hampshire, who wants to know everybody I've had contact with within the last 72 hours so they could be given a big pill. Okay. Next day, I'm sent up to the hospital up in um, Concord, New Hampshire. I spent 13 days in the hospital in Concord, New Hampshire. Well, what happened was I had bacterial meningitis and I had a pacemaker. <clears throat> and you ever heard about sometimes how people get, um, have rotten teeth and the bacteria gets into your blood system and goes into the heart? and people can die from that. Well, the meningitis bacteria went that was in my system and got on to the pacemaker that I had, the wires, and traveled into my heart. And I had bacteria meningitis growing into my heart. So I had to have a very risky operation to have the pacemaker removed from my heart and all the wiring. Then I went home and then I went on a heavy duty um, regimen of antibiotic infusions to help clean out my system. It took five months before I got cleared up. It was five months of basically being restricted to bed, not be able to do anything. I'd get up, maybe eat a little bit, go to the bathroom a little bit, go back to bed for five months. 
it took about eight months before I could recover to somewhat back to normal. I never recovered everything back. Okay. When I said people could needlessly die because of people oversimplify things about COVID-19. Well, if my meningitis had been viral meningitis, I would have been dead. That delay in getting me into the hospital and getting treated with viral meningitis would have killed me. And how would my death been um, listed? There's no question in my mind my death would have been listed as COVID-19 related because they would have said Mr. Roberts had a high fever, 103, 104, and because of that, that's a sign of COVID-19. Okay? But then look on the other side. If my temp if I had gone back, gone home, my after they sent me home, my temperature had broken, gone down. And I said, Oh well, all well and good. You know what? I could have been like typhoid Mary. I could have gone to school board meetings. I could have gone to um, Walmart. I could have gone to Hannaford. could have gone to a whole bunch of places. And I would have been carrying active <clears throat> meningitis bacteria. And I could have coughed. Could have coughed in my hands. Could have wiped it on the door. I could have done things. And then I could have been spreading meningitis around the city of Keene. And, hey, I was 60, in my 60s, so who would expect someone that old to have meningitis? They'd be looking for younger people. And so other people could have caught, un, unexpectedly caught many bacterial meningitis from me because... <clears throat> It's, uh, Mr. Roberts had nothing to worry about. No big deal. Just go along your way. Don't even bother coming in because it's most likely COVID. And if my daughters weren't nurses, I probably would not have gone in. I would not have gone to convenient care or convenient MD the next morning. I would have just hoped that I felt better. I just say, oh, bad case. Okay. And then what I didn't re realize about um, bacterial meningitis, according to some of the research, one out of every five people with bacterial meningitis die. A lot of people with bacterial meningitis have parts, have parts of their limbs amputated. And so... If I presented with the same symptoms today, and it would, it's, oh, wow, all bang, 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 they would have rushed me into an isolated unit and doing a bunch of different tests on me and not allowed to let me go home. Because they would not only try to save my life or whatever or treat me but they would want to make sure if i had an infectious disease i would not be spreading it out in the community that would be the proper protocol okay when we had covid19 the medical people did not necessarily follow the proper protocol. Yes, there was money to be made in labeling debts COVID-19 related. 
and <clears throat> I don't care what most people say, the medical field, like education, college, up higher level education, doesn't worry too much about the outcomes. They worry about the bottom line. What can we do to increase our profit margin? Okay. College doesn't care if 40% of the people don't graduate in, four, in six years. Hey, if they pay 50,000 bucks to us and don't graduate, hey, not our problem. Or, yeah, where else do you have somebody goes, hey, I know this is what 100% is. But if you take 150% as long as you should, or 50% longer, we're going to consider that a success. Why do college consider that a success? Well, if it's $25,000 a year for four years to get a four-year degree, and I can get you to pay $150,000 over six years for a four-year degree, success. Yeah, you're in debt. Yeah, you may not get a job to pay off that debt, but it was successful for our bottom line. Okay? For hospitals, what's for the bottom line? What most people don't understand, they have venture capitalists. Okay, those people that raise money and look in the way to turn a quick profit. They're going around the country and buying up small hospitals, big hospitals and everything. And the first thing they do is look at what do we do to cut costs? Okay. Well, for a lot of people, cardiology, neurology, um, Uology, cardiology, neurology, a lot of places, you can go and you don't get to see a doctor anymore. You get to see a nurse practitioner. Okay, why? Hey, you can pay a nurse practitioner 100000 sometimes even less. Okay, why should we pay a doctor? And so... Hey, my wife's brother-in-law had his hip replaced uh, about three weeks ago. You know what? It was same-day surgery. Brought him in, sliced him open, put the new hip in, take the old out, put a new one in, and sent him home the same day. Why? Because it's so much cheaper. Hey, Having a baby, it used to be a woman had a baby, she could stay in the hospital for three to four days to rest to recuperate. Try to find a place where a woman stayed in the hospital for more than 48 hours. Mm, nope. It's money driven. So the quality of the, medic, medic, the medical services or medical care delivered is money dependent. And so, you don't have good insurance, you're not going to get good health care. And depending on who's your insurance company, you may not get to see doctors very often. You're going to see nurse practitioners and physician assistants and stuff. That's the way it goes. And so, with COVID-19, a lot of health care providers these hospitals and stuff, it was more advantageous for them to have people pass from COVID-19 than to pass for some without looking. Ah, we don't even have to do an autopsy. Yep, COVID-19 had a fever, bingo, COVID-19. Yes, there were some conscientious people 
my sister-in-law, my brother died. Okay, we couldn't see him because it was during COVID-19. And yeah, it, it really sucked. All we could do was see him at the funeral home laid out on um, a gurney. That was it. And then um, he was buried, no funeral. We couldn't go see and things like that. And then later on, the um, my sister-in-law went over and talked to the doctor and the doctor changed the death certificate and added COVID-19 onto it. And because FEMA was paying some money for COVID-19 and a bunch of stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of unethical doctors out there, medical providers out there, just like there's unethical lawyers and stuff. They're there to make personal money to enrich their own um, pockets. And so I don't think the American public is going to, even if COVID-19 comes back and it becomes a serious um, condition, I don't think the American people are going to put up with it. Yes, I've taken um, my vaccines because I interact with a, a lot of people. Um, you know, I've had different cancers and different things like that. And the thing with the meningitis, I have to be careful due to health-related issues, so I take the vaccine as a precautionary, just like I take my flu shot and I take my pneumonia shot. I know you can't get the flu from um, the flu shop, even though people don't do it. But that's my um, choice. Um, and I'm not going to force it on anybody. I have um, my wife got COVID-19. She got it really bad. I have three daughters. Two of them got um, COVID-19. One of them got it twice. I got nine grandchildren. Eight of them got COVID-19. Um, a um, couple of them had it twice. Myself and my granddaughter, one of my granddaughters didn't get COVID-19. So some people have natural immunity. Others don't. And when they go and say um, people can have natural immunity, well, Dr. Fauci was right until he said no. And then he back and forth, the answer is yes, people can have natural immunity. For example, the bubonic plague, the back black plague, and all those that killed almost about 75% of the um, people in Europe. <clears throat> Research shows that the people that survived had a genetic preposition to protect themselves from that bacteria. So there is, and so it, people have mutated genes that protect them. And so some do. I may have had a mutated gene. My granddaughter may have had a mutated gene that we did not catch COVID, even thought we were around people who had COVID all the time. Didn't get it. So it was three. One daughter, myself, and one granddaughter did not get um, <clears throat> COVID-19. And two of them didn't take COVID shots. And so... Bingo. Yes, for the people on the other side who say, well, Mr. Roberts, maybe you got COVID-19 and because you had the vaccine, you never even realized you had COVID-19. Well, maybe, but you can't prove a negative. And no matter how much you try, you can't prove a negative. So we don't know. I never lost taste or smell. I never got any of the 
symptoms. One of my grandsons, Xavier, the pot that he hated was he lost his taste, taste of smell. And he loved steak. And I used to say, hey, Xavier, let's go to Long Island. I'll buy you a steak. He didn't appreciate that. So that's one of the things that is coming up with COVID-19. And again, I don't see the American people just rolling um, out of fear with they did last time. Also, if they have to shut down, the American government just doesn't have the money to throw another four to five trillion um, dollars out. Okay. The moving on, speaking again from a little personal experience. Um, I've been elected to the city council five times, four two-year terms, and the um, the last time I had a write-in campaign and got enough votes to be both on the at-large and at the ward. I took the ward and I won and I won a four-year um, term, so I've had ten years on the city council with a break. I've been to the Keene School Board 19 years, <clears throat> had eight elections, I've won seven, and I I lost one, so I had a three-year break. I was up at the State House for um, six terms, 12 years, and I was a committee chairman. The um, <clears throat> I ran for mayor against... Um, Excuse me. Incumbent, well-known um, mayor lost by about 200 votes. I ran for the state senate and got um, my butt hand handed to me. So then I spent over 20 years active duty in the Marine Corps. I worked for the state of New Hampshire for a little bit more than six years. And <clears throat> one of the things that I've learned in, in all those, <clears throat> you can only go so far. You can be doing an outstanding job, have great leadership, do, be quite knowledgeable, all those things, but you can, and I've always, yeah, I spent a couple of places on nonprofits, president of the Keene Senior Center and stuff. You can only go so far before you start having to sell part of your soul. And it becomes the question is, how much of yourself are you willing to give up to move up? And that's why you'll see people, some people will go bang, 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 and it says, I'm out of here. And you'd go and say, why did that person leave? That person had so much talent. That person had so much to offer. Or oh, that person's a great teacher. Why don't they move up to be um, an administrator? Would make a great principal or a great superintendent. <clears throat> or why isn't that <clears throat> person um, is a great bursar at the college or a great provost at the college? And why doesn't want to become a college president? And you can look at a bunch of different companies, corporations, nonprofits, and you look at because once you get to a certain level, you have to give up part of yourself to move up. And there are a lot of people <clears throat> who say, you know what? I'm not selling my soul to move up. I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror 
and say, yep, I did the right thing. And I've always told people, and um, I would say, you have to learn to dance with the devil without selling him, him your soul. And you have to be able to waltz with the angels without thinking you're God. And that's a pretty hard and delicate and almost really impossible thing to do. And <clears throat> no one, everybody has faults. But we've had people in this country that were willing to try their best. Okay. President Taft, the Roosevelt's, <clears throat> President Lincoln, Congressman and President John Quincy Adams, John F. Kennedy, um, Lyndon Bain Johnson. Lyndon Bain Johnson, who did that with the um, civil rights legislation. Not a great person, but he did what was right to do. He knew it was going to cost. President Kennedy did the same thing with some of the civil rights stuff. Abraham Lincoln was doing the right thing. It uh, almost cost him re-election, but it cost him his life. Okay, um, <clears throat> President Garfield went through the Civil War into Congress and up cost him his life because he did the right thing. Teddy Roosevelt, one of the most progressive presidents in the United States, it cost him. John Quincy Adams, who did the um, Armistead, where you had a bunch of um, Afri enslaved Africans took over the ship and then sued the federal government f for their freedom. And John Quincy Adams represented them in court and won. John Quincy Adams did not sell his soul so he could win over um, <clears throat> over Andrew Jackson. So you could go over a number of people. Edmund Ross. People don't know who Edmund Ross was? Edmund Ross was a senator, and he was deciding vote not to throw Andrew Johnson out of office. And the reason he did it, because he knew how it was going to affect the future of the country. You had a bunch of radicals that did, Republican radicals from the North who decided that this is, they didn't want Johnson because he wasn't doing everything they wanted. So they were going to impeach him. And Ross, Edmund Ross, stood up. Edmund Ross is in John F. Kennedy's um, Profiles and Courage. Okay? He was punished for that. But, you know what? Yes. You can say John F. Kennedy was a womanizer. Someone say John F. Kennedy took too many um, painkillers. John F. Kennedy had sex with Marilyn Monroe. Or President um, Franklin Roosevelt had a mistress. Um, you know, <clears throat> you, you can go on and on and on and listen, read. You can dig dirt up on everybody but it's the losers that tried to bring down the people are doing 
a great job. And so now, <clears throat> doing that experience that I've had and stuff, we're getting ready for elections. <clears throat> okay. Now look at that. Look at this. <clears throat> you have 80-year-old President Joe Biden. You have <clears throat> Donald Trump. Okay, former President Donald Trump is heavily obese. I guess a English teacher would say you can't use heavily obese. But Donald Trump is, have, is obese. So when you look at the charts of President Biden, when you look at his mental decay, and you look at the lifestyle Donald Trump is leading, and so if either one of them was being sworn in for President of the United States on January 20th, 2025, neither one of them would have more than a 50% chance of living through their next full term of presidency of the United States. The chances of either one being mentally competent to finish that term to 2029 is a, it's going to be much lower than that. Donald Trump is a heart attack or stroke away. He may explode at any one time and have an aneurysm. Bingo. Not wishing it on him, but he could have that. President Biden, is his ability to speak, his ability to comprehend is getting worse and worse. And so, look at it. You would think that the, um, the American people would be wising up and saying, you know what? We need younger, more competent individuals that could help the country, not the party. Okay. And this individual said, a famine of political courage damages our nation. Our elected officials have demonstrated the lack of courage to do the right thing because of fear of personal consequences, criticism, and party pressure. Politicians voting as the party demands instead of as their conscience dictates has become the norm. This occurs on both sides of the aisle and is commonly accepted as good governance. Is this the really the way it has to be? You know, the army is trying to figure out why the hell can't they get people to join? They're short 15,000 this year. They're short 15,000 last year. They're even creating a boot camp for people to lose weight or people to practice the test so they can pass the test to get in. The reason the army is not getting people to join is because the army leadership and the Air Force leadership are becoming far too political. We have general officers, we have colonels and above who are kissing the rumps of politicians doing what they can be politically. When the president says, I'm going to nominate someone of color, I'm going to do this or do that. I'm not going to nominate the best qualified person, but you know what? We haven't nominated a woman for this, 
so we're going to nominate a woman for this. We haven't not nominated um, a transgender for this, so we're going to nominate this. We have an um, Air Force colonel who was selected for Brigadier General who came out and says the problem with the Air Force was all these white colonels who weren't doing their job and they were preventing um, diversity from increasing in ranks. So is it saying you qualified white colonels, you need to quit so we can bring in less qualified LBGQ, different races, different religions, all these people up to get the numbers to a level that looks good. And, hey, you know what? The military has done really good. The enlisted ranks have done good. Um, senior leadership, all colors and everything. The, the, the armed forces, we have more and more um, generals of women, general and flag officers, uh, uh, women, people of color, women of color. We even have openly um, gay and lesbian um, members, senior officers. Okay. But because we, we have general officers who are becoming political like they did in Vietnam, where they would kiss the rumps, or like we would have to say, their heads are so far up the politician, but they have a ring around the neck. That's why men and fathers and mothers do not want to send their kids into the army. I would do everything possible to convince <clears throat> any of my ch grandchildren from ever going into the army because I can't see any army leadership that I'm proud of. When I see General Milley, Chairman of Joint Chief of Staff, overweight, walking around in his World War II Army uniform as if nothing happens, and who took no responsibility for the Afghan withdrawal democracy, even though he's the senior military advisor to the President of the United States, he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say a thing. I'm not going to offer my resignation. I'm not going to say, hey, you know, all you parents who sent your children over to Afghanistan, the two, three thousand, around three thousand of them who got killed. Oh, well, you did get a gold star, but I kept my star and I did not have the moral courage to resign the position be saying, Mr. President, I can't do this. Yes, I'm here to defend the Constitution, to point to defend the Constitution. I know I serve at your pleasure, but your pleasure should not be me selling out my integrity. No, he did not do that. Okay? I didn't see the Department of Defense, Secretary of Defense, Austin do that either. I didn't see any of them go and apologize to the American people. Plain and simple. No, nope. they just moved on if nothing happened. And if someone was to go and stop them and they say, hey, um, how many Marines got killed on, um, on that withdrawal from Afghanistan? Huh? Hmm? I bet they couldn't tell you. But I can tell you the, the 242 people were killed in the Beirut bombing. I may not know all the names, but I know what happened. I know the battalion commander made a mistake, and the battalion commander who got hurt seriously was sent up to the VA hospital in Boston, and that's how he ended his career before he was quietly retired. 
But no. And so political courage, public courage is one's readiness to risk significant personal loss or disadvantage in order to publicly affirm a lofty social value or principle. Self-interest action may require sacrifice and produce socially desirable results, but it doesn't count as public courage. Okay? When we talk about the party, what I learned in here is the state, the Democratic Party, especially the Democratic Party, because I used to be a Democrat, It's controlled by one guy, Raymond Buckley. Everybody seems to fear Raymond Buckley. They need to appoint, anoint his ring. Kiss Ray Buckley ring and you will get what you wanted and you'll get Ray Buckley. If you pay, if you hire Ray Buckley's people, out of your campaign fund, they can help you. Ray Buckley has made really powerful inroads into the city of Manchester. Manchester, basically, politics is controlled by the Democratic Party. He's got some inroads into Concord and Nashua and some of those other areas. We here in Keene are pretty independent um, group of people. We don't like people coming in telling us how to run our politics. William Beauregard, years back, decided that he was going to, the Republican Party was going to spend a lot of money getting William Beauregard elected as mayor of the city so he could d then run for um, the state senate over here so they can get a Republican in. And William Beauregard had like six or seven flyers, nice glassy flyers and everything that came in and people said no. Okay. Four years ago, Mitch Greenwald decided to run for mayor. Ray, he had Ray Buckley's blessing. Ray Buckley sent people over here to help run his campaign. He had Senator Shaheen. He had Senator Hassan and all those people involved. Again, I got at least six flyers, paid friends of Mitch Greenwald and everything. I wouldn't be surprised if those flyers cost $30,000, $40,000. And again, the people of Keene said no. We do not want that. It appears again, Ray Buckley is getting his hands into local politics again. And, um, <clears throat> and I think his hands in, he is like to have um, Jay Khan to be our next mayor. And the reason you would like to see Jay Khan being our next mayor because they need some more seats around here. They need, um, they want to have a Democratic mayor when they have um, the next election comes along. And the Democratic mayor could then really be pick and choose. You know what? The city can be kind of closed down when the Republican comes here, but when a Democratic candidate comes here, we can be really open. So it would be beneficial. So what you can see is that you see Jay Khan's um, signs all over the place right now. Um, Jay Khan had a big um, kickoff on doing this. Um, and so <clears throat> what I would like to say is when we get ready for this election, it has to be a local election. It has to be a 
Keene election, not a Ray Buckley election, not a Democratic Party election. Our elections in Keene are non-political. No Democrat, no Republican. You are here to represent the people of Keene, the city of Keene. You're not here to kiss a ring of Ray Buckley. You're not here to say, Keene, I'm delivering the city of Keene to the state Democratic Party. Because there's a lot of issues in Keene that are not Democratic issues, they're not Republican issues, they're not independent issues. They are local issues. Plain and simple. That's what counts. When you get ready to elect someone for the mayor or you get elect someone for the city council, you should be asking, who is your allegiance to? Are you willing to do to act in a political, courageous way to protect the interests of the well-being of the citizens of Keene? If not, don't vote for them. Call them out. Ask them to put their courage on display. If they're not willing to put their courage on display, they do not deserve your vote. They haven't earned your vote. Do not give up your vote cheaply. Because if you give it up cheaply, it can be cost quite expensive. So that's political commentation for today. And I will see you next week.